So, well, energy efficiency actually develops quite well globally uh, for two very different reasons. So we measure this by looking at what we call energy intensity. That's the amount of energy you need to produce one unit of economic output of GDP. And this is a measure which you can compare across time and across countries. What we're seeing is it comes down very fast in the developed economies as they become less industrialized and move to service sectors. And it comes down very fast in the developing countries, industrializing countries, because they use more modern technologies. If they industrialize today, they don't use the steam engine of, of yesterday, they use uh, the latest equipment and technology they can get. The end result of this is that we have today global energy efficiency uh, the best since about 110 years by this measure and that uh, another effect of, of globalization that the differences between countries are disappearing very rapidly so we see energy intensity or energy efficiency converging across countries uh, with the difference between different countries on the globe actually today the smallest since the industrial revolution this is one big force for change, structural changes. And it's reinforced, of course, by the fact that we come out of a period of 10-year very high energy prices, record prices by any definition. And that also accelerates uh, improvements on the demand side, on the consumption side of energy. And these show up in the data as uh, an acceleration in energy efficiency improvements globally. So that's good news. And uh, as to the question whether governments should do more or could do more, they certainly could do more, uh, but it is an illusion to think that this will always be economic. There's no free money on the sidewalk somewhere. So if people don't implement efficiency measures, then usually it is because they're not economic. So yes, governments could do more, but it's regulation and one has to understand that it's likely to be costly. Well, the role of natural gas is, uh, is an interesting phenomenon. The so-called shale gas revolution uh, also in, in many ways represents a decision point for uh, environmentalists or those of us interested in the environment. What we are likely to see in the future is uh, carbon emissions in the U.S. declining, partially uh, because of lower oil demand, partially because of uh, the support for renewables, but partially also because of the replacement of coal with natural gas in power generation. If you produce one kilowatt hour of electricity from coal, you get about twice the CO2 emissions than you get from producing it with gas. Uh, and so in a very real sense, for those of us interested in the environment, the question will be, what's it going to be? Fear of fracking or support of natural gas in power generation at the expense of coal, which would drive CO2 emissions lower. My suspicion is that uh, because fracking is more of a local problem and CO2 emissions more of a global one, that in the debate the local side will win. And that is another strong argument for adding a carbon price, which actually is a real price, uh, into the mix so that we can continue to reduce CO2 emissions faster than we have done in the past, which wasn't very uh, successful, it wasn't very fast at all. Well, often Often, my, especially my American friends, ask me how can these Europeans tolerate having such high import ratios and producing so little uh, energy themselves. And the short answer, of course, is that for some of them it makes sense. This is a region which for centuries has been used to the benefits of trade. And if your coal is more expensive than coal from Australia, but your cars are cheaper than cars from Australia, then it does make sense to import coal and to sell cars and export cars. But that's only half of the answer. It is also true that Europe is uh, very dependent and will remain very dependent on imports uh, and that Europe doesn't really in a broad way participate so far in the exploration of shale gas or, or of tight oil. As the infrastructure changes around them with uh, big places like the US becoming less dependent on Middle Eastern oil supplies and other big players like China become more dependent, it will be uh, a difficult task for Europe to adjust to this changing environment. But uh, I don't think it is already at the level of a crisis or so. What this also leads to is the observation uh, that it is how important it is for energy security to rely on a diversity of supplies. Very often today you hear people arguing that energy independence uh, is the answer to the energy security problem. It is not. If Japan, for example, would have been completely energy, in quotation marks, independent in the sense of not being integrated in international markets at all, it could not have possibly dealt with the cons consequences of the Fukushima disaster. It was able to deal with it because it was integrated in global gas markets and could compensate for the outage of nuclear power by importing more natural gas. 
if you are successful, for example, with ramping up renewables big time and you utilize the sun and, and the wind, then also there are consequences for energy security because the sun and the wind cannot be traded across borders. So if something happens in your country, like an earthquake or a natural disaster, which knocks out these sources, uh, they cannot be replaced, replaced if you don't have a diversified uh, portfolio of, of power generation, for example. And so I'm a strong believer is that true energy security really uh, depends on a diversity of supplies and that the real strength of today's global energy system is its interdependence and independence, whether it's in food production where everybody realizes it's a ridiculous notion or whether it's in energy where not everybody realizes that uh, is not a goal per se.